Cameras live in three, two, one. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and welcome to Listening to the Land session, um, an event um, organized by Flourishing Diversity, Invisible Dust and the British Library. My name is Marion Atieno Osieyo. Um, my pronouns are she and her. I am wearing a black blazer and a black dress um, and I have short hair and um, I identify as a Black African woman. My purpose is to work towards transforming humanity's relationship with nature. And I do that through storytelling and strategy. So currently I'm a global strategist um, on nature's contributions to people at the World Wildlife Fund for Nature. So my role today uh, in this session is to be a host and it's to create a space for us to um, bear witness to our speakers today um, through generous listening, generative questions and silence. I wanted to tell you a bit more about listening to the land. So this is a session for us to consider what it means to listen to the land um, and why it's of value to the future of our planet. Um, so in today's session, you'll hear from our speakers who will share the experiences of listening to the land, um, how it's shaped their relationship with nature, and how it's also shaped their responses to the climate and social justice. Before we start, um, I'd, I'd like to invite us to have a moment of silence. Um, mm -hmm. And the purpose of this silence is really to ground us in this present moment, um, to bring our attention, um, our intention and awareness to bear witness to each other and to the listeners who will speak today. So um, I'll invite mm -hmm. us for the silence and then I'll bring us out um, to listen to the first speaker. So our first speaker for today is Dr. Tero Mustonen. Um, he is an adjunct professor who works for the award-winning nonprofit Snow Change Cooperative based in Finland. Snow Change is a network of indigenous and local communities in the Boreal and the Arctic that works to advance the knowledge and ecosystems of the circumpolar north. Tero is also a professional winter fisherman and chief of the village of Selkie in North Karelia. He's currently serving as a lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And he's also an internationally known scholar of the Arctic, rewilding and indigenous issues. 
where he advocates for a traditional worldview and cosmology of his people. Welcome, Dr. Tero. Marion, dear colleagues, let me greet you from Eastern Finland, where we have just received the very first snow. And uh, that's essentially what I would like to try to convey to you today on this very profound group of speakers and, and colleagues. Um, one of the things that I would like to try to frame that in is the signals that we are receiving when we try to listen to the land. And humanity is spending, in my mind, maybe too much time focused now in the scanning the skies and the universe for a searching of extraterrestrial life or other signs of uh, cosmos, when in fact there's a lot of signals that we should try to learn and reconnect with just based on our own home. Trying to position these few minutes into a context of what, the, what our land teaches and how you can listen to her starts with a story where the Finns, the Finnish people belong into Finno-Ukric linguistic group. That's a group of non-Indo-European languages spanning from Western Siberia all the way to here. And unlike many other places around the world, um, the Finns and the Sami, who are then the indigenous peoples of Finland today, are related through language. A lot of the work that we do in snow change, and my personally, when I fish on the ice, has to do with trying to understand, navigate, and preserve this uh, one single thing that defines our universe, which is cold-based environments, the snow and ice, sometimes known as cryosphere. Right at this time of the year, one of the most beautiful things you can ever hear or witness and I, I was able to hear that last weekend, is the way the ice sinks. When the ice forms in our lakes and rivers, the kind of song and crackling and uh, freeze up sounds it makes have no parallel. The snow cover that came also last week here extends now hopefully all the way to early May. It used to go perhaps middle of May in the past. <laughs> And that snow cover is a book for us, if you know what you are looking for. You can see all the animal tracks, the wolverine, moose. We are now engaged in our community, moose hunts, the fox, where the raven went, or the forest crows, and so, so on. Of course, you can track animals also in non-snow environments, but the snow really opens up this pathway and the big story of what's going on in the forest. And these two environments, the lakes, the water environments that are now singing when the ice is coming and uh, <clears throat> the snow covered lands are our home. They are our center of our universe, but unfortunately they are very much under threat. One of the ways to explore the traditional knowledge from here, from our villages in the Arctic and in the Boreal, of course, has been the question of, or I'll use one example of how, how it comes to matter. Many of you will know Northern Lights in the northern parts of the planet, or at least you have heard of the Aurora Borealis. Snow Change, the organization that I work for, has been working with oral histories and indigenous and traditional knowledge all across the circumpolar north now for 20 years. And on and on, every time you go into interview and speak with the oral historians, the knowledge holders, the women from Alaska into Greenland and our fishermen, the Sami reindeer herders, you will hear a very pro profound observation. Northern lights will make sound. And it was until 2016 when science completely refused this idea. Northern lights are too, way, too far up and they will not make sound. And it actually took a Finnish scientist, Untolainen, in 2016 to prove that um, the northern sounds actually do make sound. And that's why the, the uh, inversion creates the sound in 70 meters up from the ground floor. And this is some of the examples of how indigenous knowledge and science are, or let's say science is catching up in our knowledge systems. Trying to conclude and put this into context, we are losing our snow and ice. 
our fishing season has now been cut by 50%. What used to start in mid-November starts now in early February and, and ends, what used to end in mid-May ends now in at the end of March. That's why we have to fight for the North and cryosphere. And that's why Snow Change has a rewilding program where we are trying to keep one third of world soil-based carbon on the ground and revitalize, restore and rewild uh, our precious home, all the peatlands, lakes, rivers and forests. And today it's over 30,000 hectares uh, that are under these traditional knowledge and science-based rewilding actions. And all of that is, and here I end, for peace. It's for everybody and together the Arctic matters so preciously for the whole planet and the boreal that anything we do here hopefully alleviates the troubles also elsewhere. Thank you very much and I'll be happy to take any questions you want. Thank you. Thank you so much, Taro. I'm really struck by um, something you said about hearing and witnessing how the ice sings. Um, and I wondered if there's um, opportunity for you to share um, how your, you know, your ability or your community's ability to hear the ice sing um, shapes your relationship with, with um, the local environment. How has that ability to, to really hear and relate to, to nature through sound and the way it speaks, um, how has that shaped your, your community's understanding and relationship with, with nature? Marion, thank you. Um, <clears throat> one of the things to understand is that I'm now 45 and uh, the last very proper winter that I witnessed was in 1987. Mm. So almost 30, 35 years we have now constantly been having something else. Either, either it's too warm, haywire changes in 24 hours or whatever the case. And that's why the ice song right now is so precious because it requires minus 20, minus 15 temperatures. And it's a marker. It's a marker for the change of seasons. We are also now at the Finnish Kekri or the old, old new year when autumn starts towards winter. It's the time for the winter fisheries and when the ice would sing and when it sings, it implies that we could be setting uh, our winter nets now on the ice. There's actually a saying that uh, a one centimeter ice can carry a fisherman, but two centimeters can carry a human being, which is jokingly said, but uh, it, it points to the fact that now is a very good time to start our winter fisheries. And that's why the song, um, which I can convey to the flourishing diversity, there, there are open clips if people wanna hear it, um, is so precious because it's tied up with the temperature and it marks something that has been there for thousands of years, but now is very much under threat. And uh, the whole, whole right to be cold or the fact that our traditional culture in the villages is tied up to the seasons is something that the North is really suffering from given the big, big changes underway. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Ruth. Um, what are your observations on how climate change um, is affecting local wildlife? That's a very good question. Um, a lot of our species, even in the boreal Finland, of course, they suffer from other land uses, log logging, mining, and the geopolitical interests that extractivism has on the north. But uh, if we only look at the wildlife, a lot of our, and especially the Arctic species, are adapted to the cold, especially the fish like vendes, burbot, whitefish, trout, salmon. And now that we are getting, especially in the summertime, very high water temperatures, we will face extinction events on those core fish, for example, that have defined a lot, a lot of the region, a lot of the culture and linguistic diversity. Uh, Finland and the North is also receiving a lot of Southern species. So there's a phenomenon called species on the move. We just had our first chakal, 
I could have never imagined we could have a chuckle in fin Finland, but now he's here. And that leads us to, um, we are always lack lacking time, but I'll just say one more thing. How do we connect, if there are pockets of traditional knowledge remaining, how do we then connect with those newly arrived form relations? And how do we grieve when we lose, for example, the Arctic fox or some of the other cold dependent um, species? Thank you, Tero. Thank you so much. Um, we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to listen to you. Um, so up next, we have uh, Jolie Booth. Um, Jolie Booth is an artist and producer and director of Korea Arts and the co-founder of Listening to the Land Pilgrimage for Nature. The pilgrimage journey began early September and is still in motion. And it involves a group of ordinary people taking an extraordinary odyssey um, by walking 500 miles along a route known as the Spine of Albion um, to arrive in Glasgow, which I believe Jolie's, uh, Jolie's in um, Glasgow now. Um, Edinburgh. Oh, Edinburgh. Okay, so you're still on your way. Yes, That's amazing. Right. <laughs> um, and so they're on their way to Glasgow for the UN Climate Change uh, Conference, also known as COP26. And their intention is to collect stories, dreams, and hopes from people they meet along the way and present to those in power a people's charter for the land. Jolie, thank you so much for joining us today and for making the time to, to speak with us. Thank you. Yeah, so we've just been on one hell of an adventure. Um, so the pilgrimage came about because last year I walked the Michael and Mary line, which goes along the width of the UK, um, the, the widest point, and it starts uh, near Land's End in Cornwall and ends on the Norfolk coast. And this was a personal journey. Um, I felt called cool to do it. And um, during lockdown, I was in a one bedroom flat and had no garden and just, and some friends of mine died and um, had a lot of grief. And so I set off on this journey and had such an incredible time. And the thing that um, I learned from it that was really significant was that it was just after Brexit and uh, the pandemic had just begun. And there's a lot of unrest and a lot of fear and everyone had their kind of soapbox rant that they shared with me, um, which were all barking mad as well. Like everything that everyone said was all over the place. And the thing that I was struck by was how do we exist in any shared concept of reality when everyone's realities are so different? Um, but once people had kind of got over their usual political rant that they share on Facebook and that kind of thing, um, everyone was kind everyone was generous and people looked after me and people were scared and people were in grief and everyone's just trying their best and trying to get through life and and do the best they can and that really struck me and I realized that as a pilgrim um, it's kind of an ongoing performance and that um you're almost like a traveling confessional and people can share their things with you and you're moving on and you, you kind of have to learn to let it just wash over you, but that you take this and you walk on. And, and I realized how important listening was to pilgrimage with the people, but then also with the land. But with the land, it's a very different type of listening where you're listening with all your senses. It's extremely expansive and it's observational. Um, and with both, so this pilgrimage, I was walking the Michael and Mary energy lines that run along a ley line called the micro line and I didn't know anything about ley lines when I set off it was just a route that I picked because it was a long route um, but I found that I tuned into the lines um, at first I used dowsing rods and then after a while I just found that if I looked at the map of where the lines ran at the end of the day I had walked them and so my body was drawing itself to those lines and I tuned into what the Mary felt like and what the Michael felt like. And the Mary felt like a hand on my heart saying, I've got you. And the Michael felt like a hand on my back saying, you've got this. And, and I tuned into that being kind of a masculine and feminine energy, masculine being action and the feminine holding space. 
And on the journey, my friend Anna Lehman joined me and she works for a company called Wildlife Works and she's a global um, climate advisor. And she said, oh, my, it would be so amazing to walk to Glasgow into COP26 and do a performance. And I was like, right, we're going to do it. So I applied to the Arts Council and got funding to do this journey. And then I was looking for a route to get there and found the Spine of Albion, which is another line that runs from the Isle of Wight to the top of Scotland. And around it are another masculine and feminine line called the Ellen line and the Bellinus line, which are Celtic god and goddess who are a bit akin to Apollo and Artemis. And uh, so I started in the Isle of Wight with a friend and we um, connected with the line of Ellen um, where there's these giant caves that are, uh, look like nostrils and it's like these dragon nose nostrils at the end of the land. And you could even see the line coming in where the tides met that went into the caves. And right at the start of the walk in the forest, there was this statue to Artemis that had been sculpted out of a tree. And it turned out it was where a, a female student had been raped and murdered in the forest. And in her sketchbook was this drawing of Artemis. And the Ellen energy has been very different to the Mary energy in that um, it has felt like the anger and wrath of the feminine. It's the, it's the confused, unhappy, befuddled, trying to figure it out side of the feminine. And then the masculine energy, um, the Bellinus, which is the sun god, has got this very Arthurian, like King Arthur, lion, Aslan, majesticness to it, who feels like it's holding space for the feminine to figure it out. Um, so that's been uh, part of the experience. And then as we've walked, we have spoken to everyone we've met and asked them what messages they'd like us to take to Glasgow. And just the fact that we're listening rather than walking with banners and, and coming with a political agenda has meant that we have spoken to lots of different types of people who might not have engaged with us normally. Um, but also this, this sense of um, listening with all our senses, like my, my being right now feels as expansive as the world. And my listening is, is everything. I've come into Edinburgh, into this city, and it's almost quite painful being here because of the amount of um, raw and energy and sirens and everything. I'm having to kind of pull myself back together again. But there's, uh, yeah, the side of observing how the land changed, how it was unbelievably hot in September, like abnormally hot, and the land was cracked, and the way that the farming was being done meant that the, the land was barren and it was desert. So in terms of listening, being struck by how little wildness there is in the UK, um, it's only as we got further north that we really encountered um, wildness. So yeah, that's where we're at the moment. We've walked to Edinburgh and we'll soon walk over to Glasgow and share all of the, what we've learned in performance and with a charter. We've asked people to give us quotes and we've put them on um, patches, which we're putting into one big charter that's a scroll that we'll hand over to the delegates when we get there. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. There is so much in what you shared. <laughs> I'm trying to <laughs> really uh, come home to everything. Mm. I, I've been struck by something that you've said, um, that the pilgrimage is, what I've heard is that the pilgrimage has given you a chance to listen to people as opposed to um, coming with a political agenda. Um, and I'm really humbled by that. Um, because I'm, I'm reflecting on the ways in which um, activists or people in the environmental movement are choosing to really engage um, in the conversation about what's happening with, with our planet. You know, how, how are we making space to genuinely listen um, with the intention of listening and uh, not, you know, to create space to take something, a campaign or, um, so that's that's really moved me and it's resonated with with me and I'm um, something that I'll I'll take away to reflect on in in my journey going forward. Um, there is something that I'm sensing as you were speaking, which uh, you the way in which you speak about your experience um, reflects this uh, level of consciousness that is at the same time, very embodied. Um, you're really able to speak so clearly about how this experience has, has changed and shaped and communicated with you. 
Um, and at the same time, it's very cosmic, um, your consciousness. And I'm, I'm wondering how we can create space for people to um, experience this level of consciousness in their, in their daily lives and as they are evolving and understanding and processing their relationship with nature and at the same time processing what's happening to, to our planet. Um, it's a big question. You don't have to have the answers, but uh, it's something that we've thought about a lot. So um, the big things that are coming through uh, is re-indigenization. So mm -hmm. I think that uh, more indigenous cultures, you know, uh, listening um, to Tero, the, the hearing the, the northern lights and hearing the ice, it's something that when you live in a very populated place like the UK, we are not tuned into that. You know, how many of us know the sounds of the seasons changing or the difference between the rustles in the trees, which some people do know, but it's uh, something we would have probably all known, you know, our ancestors. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's an opportunity for um, people from more, you know, built up places to learn to listen from a different space, which comes from a place, I think, more than anything of absolute love. And I think sometimes the environmental movement, it, there's the rod and the carrot, you know, the, the rod and the carrot. And I think that quite often we're used to the rod, you know, feeling bad about everything that we've done and we should, but that's very much the, the prevailing energy. But then the carrot is the absolute abundant, loving, giving aspect of Mother Earth and, and our relationship with her. And the more in love you are with the, with, with the Earth and all the beings on it, including other people, the less you want to damage her you know and it's it, it's how to encourage people to just learn the names of the plants that are outside their front door and in the park and to know how they can help and heal you and have names for them and relationships with them and just to begin a, developing a love affair that's passionate and deep and and then everything else is just obvious it's like well of course I'm gonna not drop litter or pick this up or switch those lights off like it's it's tending to someone that you care about and love mm -hmm. and I think it's part of the reason why there's so much depression and anxiety in in western cultures because our disconnect is from our mother and from the source and it means that we feel uh, like there's no meaning and our life isn't sacred and it's about making the inner and outer one you know make your whole life a sacred act and make everything you do divine and put divine beauty at the center of everything and yeah to re-indigenize and bring this inner and outer into one thing um, i think would be beneficial to everybody mm, absolutely living with love and leading with love and the places that we felt feel the most resilient that we've passed through are the communities that are working together and mm. there have been many, especially in the North, who just feel like the powers that be aren't going to have their interest or even know that they exist. So how can they work together and how can they look after each other? And I think it's this place of love and place of community is, is the thing that I will try and keep working with because I feel that it will, it will help my safety in the future. And the word transition as well has been a big word. Like how do we transition into a different way of living and the unknown, which is terrifying, which pilgrimage is, you know, and it's like the thought of walking to Glasgow, how do you do that? But it's just one foot in front of the other and us looking after each other. And uh, one of the pilgrims came up with an amazing quote, which is uh, community is an ongoing conversation about how to share space. And we've constantly in this group just had to work out how to share space when we're wet and muddy and hungry and stressed and tired and have just waded through a river. <laughs> like, what, do we, what? how do we look after ourselves and each other? Um, and I think as we face this time of transition, that's the question. How do we do this together and how do we take care of each other? Um, especially when the structures that are in place are probably not going to help or look after us. Thank you. Uh, I have time for one more question. Um, it's from Manira. How does something as quiet and slow as a pilgrimage that requires deep listening and observation confront or come into contact with these bustling, large scale, imposing, fast paced corporations and oligarchs? The way I'm currently seeing them 
I'm feeling about them. It's funny because we were just in Edinburgh doing a walking tour this morning, um, being shown the, the sacred sites of Edinburgh. And there were some politicians outside the parliament um, here in Edinburgh. And they were all in their suits with their ties. And they looked as strange as I do with my hat, with my feathers. It's like, well, you're in this funny uniform and here I am in mine. But they stopped and there was a moment where they, they nearly interacted with me and were like, oh, like, you know, what, what's going on here? And then remembered that they kind of couldn't and they were pressed there. And it was just like, I think they sort of clocked that maybe I was an activist or something. And it was just like, suddenly the defences went up. But I think with big corporations and the big powers that be, they are still made up of people. And those people still have children and grandchildren and they still care about the future and they do care about um, how their family is going to, to thrive. Um, it's not a case and I'm not like, you know, sort of uh, idealistic in the sense that I think that everyone has good intentions. Uh, people don't, but I think that people have a lot better intentions than we are led to believe in the media. And to just remember that like a corporation is treated like a person legally, then they're not, that, that doesn't have a heart. But within that, there are lots of hearts. And within, you know, I met um, Edwin Booth, who runs the Booth Supermarkets, um, which is a northern chain of supermarkets. And he came to meet me uh, with a friend of his who was a landowner and they had huge, huge amounts of land and they were very wealthy. But he really cared. And, and, and they were talking about, you know, the future generations and how to protect them. And he'd phased out plastic in his shops and they hadn't been met with um, shortages during the pandemic and um, rush buying because uh, most of their uh, produce is local, locally sourced. So they didn't have the long chain that meant that they ran out of things. Um, so, you know, meeting him gave me hope because it's like, OK, you are part of the, the land owning elite. But you do care and actually these conversations are happening amongst everyone and um i once heard a speaker um from south america and i can't i, I don't remember his name because it was a couple of years ago but he said that um a whole shoal of fish doesn't choose to di change direction at the same time it takes 10 percent at the front to change direction and then the rest go with them and this pilgrimage and then other things that have been happening other pilgrimages and just things that are happening in the world at the moment i feel a, a beacons that are lighting up just saying to each other there's a bunch of us at the front who are moving and we are changing direction. And I do have loads of hope. I feel hopeful. I can see loads of beacons and, and I feel like people will follow. They haven't all got to be on board, but they'll just they'll go with the flow if that's the way we're going. So I have hope in that sense. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm very grateful. Um, <laughs> we'll now move on to our next speaker. Um, speaking of hope. Uh, Satish Kumar. Um, Satish is a lifelong activist and former monk who in 1962 started a peace pilgrimage to the nuclear capitals of the world from India to Moscow, London, Paris and the US. Walking without money and depending on the hospitality and kindness of strangers. In his 50th year, Satish took, undertook another pilgrimage again carrying no money. This time he walked 2000 miles to the holy places of Britain, a venture he describes as a celebration of his love of life and nature. Now in his youthful eighties, Satish has devoted his life to campaigning for ecological regeneration, social justice and spiritual fulfillment. Satish is the founder of the Resurgence Trust an educational charity that seeks a just future for everyone. Welcome, Satish. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words and wonderful to listen to the two speakers before me. I am an earth pilgrim and earth and land are one. In order to listen to the land, we have to be on the land. We have to be off the land. We have to be in the land. Quite often we are a little bit away from the land and therefore we don't listen to the land. We are stuck in our apartments and compartments and cars and trains and for computers and so on. So I decided to listen to the land, to go out and go out, not in a car, not even on a bicycle, 
not even in a, in a horse cart, but on my two legs. So I can touch the land. I can touch the earth. I can feel the soil. I can feel the air. I can see the clouds. So I can be part of nature. And when I started to walk from India, I had no money. I decided to walk without any money because land will give me food. Food doesn't come from money. It's our idea, our social construct that we think money will buy food. When I go to an apple tree, apple tree doesn't ask me, have you got your wallet? Have you got your visa card? Just apple tree gives you apple, whether you are a man or a woman or a young or old, or black or white, or you are a human or animal or birds or wasps or bees. So I wanted to walk without money. And I started from India. And at that time, it was the height of Cold War. And I said, nuclear weapons are sin against nature. If you drop a nuclear bomb, it will not only kill humans, it will kill all uh, uh, animals, forests, lakes, oceans, rivers, plants, wasps, bees, insects, everything will be destroyed. Therefore, we have to somehow stop this nuclear arms race. As a symbol to listen to the land. If we listen to the land, then in land, everything is in harmony. Apart from humans, nobody has created nuclear weapons. And so listening to the land, I walked every day, 10 miles, 15 miles, and after a while, even 20 miles a day. And I walked through Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, and went to Moscow, Russia. And then walked from uh, uh, Russia to Belorussia, Poland, Germany, Belgium, France, England, America, Japan. 15 countries, more than 8,000 miles of walking for two and a half years. And what I learned <coughs> is that land speaks to us, but we have to hear the, the, the language of the land. It doesn't speak English, it speaks landish, land language. You know, Shakespeare got it. Shakespeare said, tongues in trees, books in running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. Trees speak to us in tree English. And, and the brooks, the rivers, the, the streams are the book of nature. We have to learn to read the book of nature. Like the Aboriginal people have song lines the song of the earth. And so when we can listen to the, the tongues of the trees and read the book of the brooks and hear the sermons from the stones, stones give us sermons of peace and resilience and endurance. You don't have to go to the church or mosque or, uh, or a synagogue or a temple to hear the, the, uh, the sermons of love and compassion you can hear from the stones and from nature. And good in everything. The moment you realize that this creation is beautiful and we are part of that creation. The moment we start to listen to the land, we know that we are the land. We are made of the soil. The humans and the humus come from the same Latin root. Humans and humus, humus means soil, the land, the earth. So human beings are literally soil beings. And so we, our food is made of earth and soil and land. And our trees are made of the soil. And our clothes are made of the soil. So that experience came to me by walking on the land and realizing that we have to make peace with the land. We have to make peace with nature. We have to make peace with the earth. At the moment, the way we are treating our planet earth is like acts of war the way we are destroying our rainforests, the way we are emitting carbon in the atmosphere and greenhouse gases to create climate change. It's a violence to nature. It's a war against nature. So we have to make peace. 
the way we put animals in factory farms and treat them cruelly, and the way we treat soil with poisons and chemicals and so on. That's a war against nature. So unless we make peace with nature, peace with the earth, peace with the land, we are not going to be at peace in our own heart and in our own life. And we are not going to be at peace in our human communities because humans and nature are not separate. Humans are land, humans are soil, humans are nature. We are all coming from the same single origin, same single source of the Big Bang. The, the animals, the forests, the wasps, the bees, the insects, they are all our ancestors. Before we were born, they were there before us and we have come from them. So we have to listen and be one with nature, united. The moment you have that sense of earth community, not only human community, but a biotic community, the living community of the earth. The moment we feel a sense of community with the earth, we can be true earth pilgrim. I am an earth pilgrim. And I, every day, every day I go out and walk to the sea, walk along the river, walk among the trees, walk under the trees, walk among the flowers and listen to them, their beauty, their generosity, their spirit, their kindness, their compassion, their gifts to me. Air is a gift, flowers are a gift, fruits are a gift, everything is a gift. So if we can live and celebrate and cherish that gift, then we will not have this war against nature and climate change and global warming and all the biodiversity diminishing and all the po oceans polluted with plastic will not happen if we listen to the land. So human beings, humanity, wake up, open to your heart, open your ears, open your mind and listen to the land. Thank you. Wow, Satish, thank you. Oh. You are welcome. <laughs> I need a moment. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Uh, okay, I'm grounding myself. Uh, we have a question from Izzy. Uh, how do we get people to make peace with nature on the scale that we need it to enact positive change for nature and ourselves? because there needs to be a huge psychological shift away from this war against nature. Yes, but how yes. do we do this and make it happen in time? Yes. You have to, we have to do it step by step. Mm. You cannot do it overnight. And all of us have to start with ourselves. Have we made peace with the earth? Mm. Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change that you want to see in the world. So we have to be the radiators of peace with the earth. We have to radiate that peace from our heart. So start with yourself, by your example. And then the second step is to communicate your experience, communicate your, like we are doing now, this wonderful uh, gathering of people, we are communicating. Communicate your, your spirit and your love for nature. Your, your compassion and kindness to nature. Communicate it through your songs, like John Lennon sang the songs of love, like uh, uh, John Byers sang the songs of love, like Picasso painted the pictures. So you can communicate through books, through poetry, through songs, through architecture, through gardening, whatever way you can communicate, tell other people. If one person communicates with 100 people, 100 people communicate with 1,000 people, 1,000 people communicate with 10,000 and 1 million, that's how the big movement begins. Nelson Mandela's anti-apartheid movement started with communicating those ideas. Martin Luther King's movement started with communicating the, uh, the uh, anti-racism uh, message and Mahatma Gandhi's um, anti-imperialism message. They all started by communicating your ideas. So all of us, the person who is asking that question, learn to communicate your conviction, your ideals, and your values uh, through songs, through music, through any way. And then organize, organize, join the movement. You are not alone. Like many, many tributaries make a great river. 
Many, many small individuals make a great movement. So don't sit and think, how do we do it? No, just do it. There's no way to peace. Peace is the way. Just do it. Go out, join Friends of the Earth, join uh, Synchronicity Earth, uh, join Greenpeace, join Extinction Rebellion, join uh, Friday for the Future. Join something. Don't just sit there. So be the change, communicate the change, organize the change. That's how the change happens. Thank you, Satish. Um, I'm going to take one more question. We have quite a few coming in for you. Um, and this is related to notion or understanding of violence. So is the natural world truly in harmony? How do we explain invasive species that kill or wipe out other species? How do we explain microbacteria and fungi that kills and monopolizes terrains? <laughs> no, you know, the life and death are part of our cycle of being. Mm. Um, so we all die. Millions of people are born and millions of people die. It's the violence is when we kill and when we kill with anger and we kill with animosity and create wars, that's a different kind of uh, uh, um, death than the death which comes naturally. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, for food, for our survival, we can take fruit, we can take herbs, we can take vegetables, we can take wood to build a house with frugality, with humility, with a sense of gratitude. If we can practice that gratitude and humility, then we can uh, take from nature. Nature is there to give us, like mother gives milk to the baby from her own breast. That is not um, violence. That is how reciprocity and mutuality happens. So uh, sometimes nature finds its own balance and has a kind of earthquake, has a kind of volcano, has a kind of um, extinction, uh, um, extinction, which is a natural cycle of evolution. But it's very different from the kind of wars and the cruelty that we humans have organized in order to just make money, just to make profit. There's no other purpose. So I think uh, the, our human economic growth and human profit making has become so violent that we have forgotten the land is not only a resource for money and economy, land and nature are source of life itself. We have forgotten that. So, so you cannot compare what happens in nature and how humans are acting. Humans are acting with cruelty and violence and we can stop it. But nature works in a kind of uh, large cyclical and evolutionary uh, way so that uh, earth can evolve and earth can go move on. Life and death are part of the cycle of life. Mm. Thank you so much, Satish, uh, for sharing your experiences with us today. Um, I'm really grateful. You are welcome. I have written a book called Pilgrimage for Peace. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a whole story of my walk from India to America of 8,000 miles. If, if your listeners are interested, they can get a book, uh, Pilgrimage for Peace. Pilgrimage for Peace. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Satish. You are welcome. So we have our final speaker today, uh, Ni Obodai. Uh, Ni is a Ghanaian photographer who is based in Accra, Ghana, and Maputo in Mozambique. Throughout his career, Ni has documented the diversity of the world through photography, audio, and text. His work mainly explores urban and rural culture, whilst also capturing the dynamic reality of our environment. He relishes telling stories about the people he meets and has a compelling interest in the past recounted through environmental and oral histories. He regards his visual practice as essential, illustrating the relationship humanity has with the environment. Welcome, Ni. Thank you. Um, boy, Satish, you, um, I, I, I should say this, I think he should be the last speaker because he has so much wisdom to unload on us and infect us with um, such wonderful energy and passion. Uh, so I, I feel very moved by my last, by, 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 by Satish's um, discourse and much of what he says is, everything that he says actually is true. It's what I experience myself. 
Um, but anyways, yes. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to join you today and um, share with you a little bit of uh, my life experience uh, as a human being and as a photographer, as a human being who um, explores, I explore myself and my, the relationship I have with the world around me um, through photography. Uh, and as Marianne said, it's, be it's become something very essential for me because um, having moved back to Ghana many years ago after, after growing up in England uh, in, in my youth, I had to find a way to sort of reconnect with, um, with, with Ghana and um, understanding my place within, within uh, the cultural context. And this ultimately led me um, down the road to where photography um, opened up for me uh, a way that I could, um, I understood that the, only, that, that the only real way for me to be able to understand who we are um, and who I am would be through the land and to um, always have the land as, um, as the anchor from which I, um, I learn. And so I've had some amazing experiences um, having to listen to people, especially when we judge people um, for exploitation. Um, um, or for what we might call some environmental injustices that take place, um, to go in and listen to their stories um, and to understand where they're coming from and then finding out that actually we all, we're all part of this game of exploitation um, and that there is a heart to all of us that sometimes you hear that people are terrible and then you get you find them and you actually find that you're dealing with another human being who is overcoming their own vulnerabilities um, but most of all they all come with a history as well and a history that um, comes long before them and so in my exploration um, as an artist working with the land, understanding our ecological situation as it is today, it's all really based on um, storytelling. And I think a lot of what Jolie said as well was very important is that you've got to learn to listen. And um, so I actually do more, spend more time listening than making, than making photographs uh, nowadays. Um, I'm inspired by the idea that, I'm inspired by the knowledge that the earth is, um, is a living being. We are a part of it. We feel on the ego level that we um, are, are above it uh, intellectually, intelligently. Um, and that maybe we have too many opinions coming from politics and um, uh, economics, you know, the economic driven um, uh, agendas that we, we have set. Um, but yet when, I, when I'm connecting with the land and with people in different places, um, we have very similar stories and have very similar concerns and are, I think, collectively looking for um, a solution. Um, and so in a way, you know, uh, the earth, we, I, I think what's for me, having listened to, um, uh, spiritual priestesses, priests, um, uh, poets, other artists, um, custodians of, um, historical or cultural, uh, cultural, um, histories, we, um, we, we realize that actually we, we all, we, it's, it's the same story wherever we go. And sometimes we, we, we end up playing um, being stupid and, and not listening to what 
came before before us so you know as as bob marley sang um if you don't know your past you're not gonna you're not gonna know your future so it's really important that we're able to connect and um listen to uh to those of us so for me my 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 way forward as a storyteller is always to first connect with the people um who are the custodians of our histories and uh through that then i'm able to act as an artist and um share with the world what i experience so yeah it's 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 all very much a personal journey and i think as as for all the other speakers it's um uh, our endeavors are very close it's very close to me um i live it every day i have to ask myself a lot of questions um about my role about uh, who i am as a photographer um and what that purpose is and how does that purpose play out for the um how will that how will that connect with um, those that uh, will be new to me, new to my work? How will it connect to my community? And most of all, I think, how will it inspire my children um, in the future? They might not see it today, but hopefully, um, we're part. We become part of a of a bigger conversation of um, being Earth citizens. Yes, I think I can land there. Thank you so much, Ni. Nee. Uh, that was great. That was amazing. I'm just checking to see any, if anybody has any questions because I have a question of my own. Um, Helen has asked, what kind of photographer are you? Uh, wildlife, landscape, portrait, all of the above, none of the above. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I explore a lot, like I was saying, a lot of my relationship with photography is, is um, that, you know, about um, 10, 12 years ago, I, I, I made a, a decision that um, my exploration about us as human beings would be through the land, would be uh, through this relationship because we can't live without it. I mean, um, sure, we got people flying off to space, but they're looking for land somewhere else right um uh we got people beginning to mine the sea and uh they're looking for or even to create cities within the within the sea but it's all a form of of land you know where we're we're constantly on this search and i think um for me my photography really is um is about that it's about this relationship that we have i won't say that i'm a landscape photographer although that i work with a lot of landscape uh mm -hmm. Um, obviously, it's the backbone of, of, of my work in, in these days. Um, but I'm quite happy to just be a photographer. Mm. Amazing. I might try and become, I actually have to become a pilgrim photographer because, you oh, know, yeah. um, I've got Jolie and Satish to, uh, uh, who totally inspire me with, the, with, with, their, with their vision and, their, and the mission that they have set themselves. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, um, I've just realized that our time has come to an end. Um, we're right on the dot of 3.30 um, UK time. Uh, so that brings us to a close for this conversation. Um, so I wanted to first of all, thank you, um, Ni, Satish, uh, Jolie and Tero for the opportunity to, to listen to your experiences mm -hmm. of listening to the land. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, Flourishing Diversity, Invisible Dust and uh, the British Library for creating this space for us to, to be able to connect um, in communion. And um, lastly, but not definitely not least, I wanted to thank um, everyone who has joined in today and um, really held space for us to listen um, to the speakers and also engage in conversation through questions. And I wanted to just also briefly um, mention that listening to the land session is part of a broader program of events called Living Nature, uh, which seeks to explore um, the futures of our relationship with um, the living planet. Um, through art, science, and Indigenous knowledge. So please do check out the rest of the events, which will be happening um, online over the next few days. So yeah, with that, I wanted to say thank you and um, hopefully see you soon. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.